Uh, I'll start off by saying thank you. Welcome to this, this job fair. My name is Bob Wheeler. Uh, I've been uh, an account rep here at ClearJobs.net for almost eight years. I was in the Navy prior to this. Uh, my last gig was recruiting doctors up in Maryland. Uh, so I got recruiting and not done any jobs ever since then. Uh, but I do want to introduce our panel here who were gracious enough to come in early, sit up at the tables, and they're gonna they're gonna answer some questions for us. So first of our left over there, we have uh, Andrew Jones, he's from Agile Defense. Um, just so you know, he's been recruiting for seven plus years in total. He's been in government spaces um, for quite a bit, he's been in Agile for two years now, so he's a um, got a lot of great knowledge about the recruiting process. Uh, in the middle, we've got Michelle with us. Nazanet. Michelle's from Los Alamos National Laboratories. I don't know if you guys know about Los Alamos, but it's a, it's a national lab, so they're obviously out in, in uh, New Mexico. Uh, but she's been there for about a year now as a, as a veteran recruiting specialist. And prior to that, she has lots and lots of time working at the Naval Academy in their career services and helping her services in the Naval Academy. And finally, we got Mark Sutter. Suter. 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 Yeah, like Joe Suter. Mark, Mark is uh, not a recruiter. Mark's from Lockheed Mark, Mark is a program manager. So Mark is a, he says he's a systems administrator, IT specialist. He's been doing this for 20 or 30 years now. Um, but it's great to have Mark here because we're going to talk about the hiring process. And what the, one of the things that a lot of people don't really understand is that relationship between recruiters and hiring managers. And it can look kind of wonky, so we're going to get to pull some strings a little bit on that relationship. I think that's going to really help you guys as job seekers kind of understand, you know, how, how to go with this. Um, so, before we get started, we got a, a few people here, so I just want to ask a couple questions. Uh, how many folks in here are military veterans? Just out of curiosity. So, more than half. Yeah. Um, of you guys, um, how many people here are looking for your first job since you got out of the military? So a lot of people for, for first jobs coming out. Um, uh, for the for the whole group, how many people here are looking for a job? Like if you got offered a job today or tomorrow or, or you know next month, are looking for a job like now? So a few people. How many people here are looking for jobs like in the next year? Kind of kicking the tires. So we got a good, yeah. You know, and, and you know what? I've been doing this for years. That percentage that you see as, as the room fills up, it's going to say about that. It's pretty typical. So we've got some good. Um, some good things that are going on here. So let's, we're going to kick this off with our discussion. And like I said, one of the things I want to elucidate is the, how the hiring process works and what you can do as a job seeker. Because when it comes to things like, you know, I was a, I was a Navy, I did the time Marine Corps as a hospital foreman. It might vary the most basic level of martial arts you can do. It's look at the little the hand belt. But one of the things I know is if you is when you're fighting, if, you, if they push, you pull. And if they pull, you push, right? So you want to go with the flow, right? So we're going to talk about the hiring process. So the more you can know about how the process works, you can be pushing where they're pulling or pulling where they're pushing, right? So we're going to talk about the hiring process. So the first thing I want to do, we're going to talk to Mark as a program manager. So Mark, what, what is your role in the hiring process? Like, how does that work for you? So for me, uh, it's identifying the need uh, within the organization. So we'll identify a need. Um, and then I'll start the process of opening a rack. Uh, the process of opening a rack and getting it approved so that it's out and available for you to apply uh, could take five to seven days. Uh, once that rack is out there, uh, then it's, I call it with, it's reactive recruiting, you know, relying on the recruiter uh, to go out and, and obtain resumes to present to me. Um, that process takes a long time. Because oftentimes when you apply to a job at any big company, your resume is going to go through a scanner and it's going to key on certain words. Mm -hmm. So the amount of time that it takes me to get a qualified candidate can take weeks, if not months. Yeah. And when, when they bring you a set of resumes to look at, I mean, do they typically bring you? Is it like, like a hard number or is it, does it vary? It varies. And right now it's a, it's a really challenging time uh, to get enough resumes in, into the system. Which is why I'm here. <laughs> um, I call it reactive recruiting. Yeah. Whenever I'm waiting for our recruiter to give me resumes, that's reactive. I'm waiting for you to give it to me. I'm doing what I call now is proactive recruiting, where I'm I'm going to job fairs. I'm seeking people. I'm looking to make uh, on the spot offers today. If you want to come live in Denver or Sunnyvale, <laughs> California, come see me because I'm making offers today. 
So, so, he, so that's one spot. So he's a program that he's got a need, right? And now, first of all, if he's got a need, that means he's also short staff, right? There's a reason that he's got a need. These people get hired, so he's busy. So he can't do all the recruits. He has to push that off, not push it off. He has to be the line recruits. Now let's start with Andrew over here. Andrew, so you're a recruit. So how many program? How many? How many? He said about the recs. How many recs are you supporting? How many program managers are you supporting? On average, at least twenty-five requisitions. Um, probably. 15, 15 different program ideas. Yeah. So, so Andrew's got 15 marks that he's dealing with spread across all those different rooms. What about you? So I'm unique. I'm very unique to the lab in that they created a goal for me to be veterans recruit. To go out specifically and let the veterans make them aware of opportunities at the lab. And I then take your resumes and shoot them to the sourcers on our team, saying, I think this guy is a great people for this position. And uh, I'm here to advocate and help them through the application process. My colleagues, on the other hand, are assigned to specific hiring managers, and they're sourcing 14, 20 jobs at a time. And we get over 35,000 applications a year. So it's great to have you here as a special person because you're doing a lot of outreach, but then you're also bringing these people and putting them into this process. I'm the money. They're trying to direct the right process. Yeah, Jesus Park. So yeah, just to add to that, to put it all into perspective, the recruiter that that um, is assigned to uh, the organization that I represent, he has approximately 500 reps that he's trying to manage. 500 internal reps that we have out. There. So he's trying to manage 500 of these. So now you see the bottleneck, why I call it reactive recruiting. My rep just falls through the hole. Right? It falls in the crack with this guy. So I got to do something different to come out and meet you guys face to face. And one of the things that I like to bring up is, is that you know every relationship is different. You know, so, so Andrew's got said five or six hiring managers. Every one of those is a different person. It works differently, has different needs, sometimes it has different, different timing issues too. And I, and I think what we want to take away from this is, is that's why you might you know talk to somebody who got hired at Lackey Martin and they say, well, this is how it worked. And then when you go to talk to somebody who doesn't work the same, you're like, what's going on? Or you might even talk to Andrew and say, well, somebody says, well, I got hired and Andrew was my recruiter and it worked exactly like this. And then you talk to Andrew again and it doesn't work exactly like that because do you have, do you have different hiring managers who have different personalities? Oh, yeah. I've never seen one of them. Yeah. And, um, you know, certain contracts get the answer the same day and others think things so busy. Yeah. And then we take Michelle's position here. So, you know, obviously your position as a as a veteran specific outreach person, exactly. Los Alamos must obviously think there's some value in what you do. So are you you know, are you like helping to put them in the right spot? Yes, I am I'm learning my way around the different job requisitions at the lot and recognizing that our job titles really don't reflect the position. So I'm learning what those mean and where to put the talent, working through the assumption that because we're a laboratory, we're only looking for scientists, we're not. We need program and project managers, we need technicians, we need every single thing. And then trying to learn, build the working relationships with the sourcers and the hiring manager. So, so for those of you who don't know what a sourcer is, a sourcer is somebody in the recruiting team who just looks for resumes or goes places just to find people. They're right. the people reaching out to you on LinkedIn. They're, they're the ones reaching out to LinkedIn. They might be the one who does the first initial phone interview where they basically say, you know, hey, are you are you a real person? Do you really have the search that you say you do? Are you even at all interested? And then they might pass you to the recruiter. And then the recruiter starts talking about because the recruiter has talked to the program manager, usually they do what's called intake meeting. So the, the program manager says, like, I really want, like, it says this, this, and this, and really this is the most important, this is the least important, you know. That, that kind of thing. That the recruiter has that relationship that the sourcer doesn't, but the sourcer's doing all that work of trying to do. And even if you talk to a tiny company, and you and, and the, the only person you talk to was the owner of the company, they're still basically doing all three of those functions. They're still sourcing, they're still recruiting, they're still interviewing, they're still hiring. So all those things always happen, but the bigger the company, the more the more they have to have you know different pieces of that to, to kind of break it down. What's the biggest challenge that you have in the, in the recruiting process? Is it, is it the time that it takes to set things up? Is it doing the actual interviews? Or, or what is it that's just... 
I think right now the, the biggest challenge that we have is just getting people to apply to jobs. Um, the entire process is very, very time consuming. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of applicants like to play games with it. Um, I'm going to get an offer to go give it to my company to get more money. There's a lot of money that's spent by companies to make you an offer. There's a lot of investing, investing of time that goes into that by a lot of different people. Um, but I think the biggest challenge that I have is getting qualified people um, to apply and people that really know the material that they're claiming that they what about you? You give me this, Michelle. You have a unique position. So, what's your you specific challenges like the? Well, now that the word's getting out that I'm a veterans recruiter, I cannot keep up with the email flow in my inbox and not kind of give the attention that I'd like to give to the candidates because it's it's an onerous process. And the other challenge is um, sometimes our jobs are open for six months. So trying to find the candidates to come in that are interested in those jobs and telling them, no, you don't have to get a temporary job at Home Depot. You know, we can we can make this work. So I'm in a better position when I when you're when candidates tell me they're a year out for 18 months out. That makes me giddy with relief because we're not agile. If you're looking for a job in two weeks, I can't I can't simply work through the process. That's, That's a great right. point, which you just brought up. I mean, the difference between, I'll get to you in a second, but the difference between Michelle and, and Mark is Mark will be somebody right, right now. Like, like, like Mark will give you a ride to work today. I will give you a ride. <laughs> you will work an offer out today. If you're the right person, and, and Michelle is more of a long term person, I think that Andrew's position is a recruiter where he could be somewhere in between, or he could be with all those different reps. He could be all those places at the same time, depending on the job. So, what, what's a big challenge for you, Mark? Or, I, mean, I would say the marketing. Um, not having enough candidates in the right place. Um, also, um, not having the right level of candidates sometimes. Uh, there's, uh, so when, when someone, when, that's a question we get a lot from veterans, like when it says like, top secret clearance required or, or polygraph required, you know, how hard, you know, how hard and fast is that as a rule? You know, can you sponsor? Like that, those are the types of questions I think a lot of people get. So, well, let's, why don't you answer that first and we'll kind of work our way back this way on that. That's a very common question. Um, each contract is different, so there's certain contracts that we are able to sponsor, but typically when it gets up to TS uh, or TS SDI level, sponsor, it probably has to be a secret um, for it. So certain contracts work to sponsor. So that's really the biggest thing is, is understanding which contracts. Yeah. Michelle, well, sounds like so it's got a Q clearance, right? Very unique in another TOE, so it's L and it's Q. We will pay for you to get your clearance. If you already come with your clearance, then it converts a lot faster. So rather than twiddling your thumbs for eight months waiting for your clearance to come through, if you already have one, we can convert it and get you on and running in a couple of weeks. But we will take care of that. So as a Navy wife, and my husband was a defense contractor, we always had clearance. Now I think I'm all that because for the <laughs> first time in my life, I have a clearance, but. Um, I got cleared in, uh, I applied in July, just got my clearance last week. So it was a fairly quick process for me. If you don't know Q&L, then this, so, so the national labs, they work as part of the Department of Energy. So those, those are those are energy level clearances, which usually deal with, you see a lot of like nuclear. So L would be the equivalent to secret, Q would be the equivalent to top secret. Yeah. And, and, if, if someone has the secret, is it pretty simple just to slide that over, or is it still kind of a it's a, the pro, it's a process, but it converts much faster. Much faster. Yeah. Now, so what about you? Now, your jobs are obviously more specific. I mean, these guys are talking like across the board, but for your particular program, you know, um, can you can you sponsor? What if, what if the person's got exactly the right skills with the wrong clearance? How does all that stuff work? Like so, <clears throat> at Lockheed Martin, our need is immediate. Uh, we're winning so many contracts. We need people to. We need you to have a TSSCI. Um, we need you to have a poly in addition to that. We need Security Plus. Security Plus we can work with and wait on. Uh, we typically will give you 60 to 90 days to obtain Security Plus. But the TSSCI is a requirement because all of the programs that I'm representing need TSSCI today. Yeah. And one of the things about a larger company might be they might have spaces to put you somewhere else. If you have a good fit, they can do an internal piece. But when it comes to talking to the actual program manager, you know, Mark is here for his program, right? So he's answering questions about that. That's that the, the hiring manager's big need is that the recruiter and those recruiters that are, that are here, 
their job is to kind of see the big picture. They might be able to say things like, well, you might not be a fit for Mark's program, but I know more about all these other programs than you might be a fit over there. So that, you know, this is one of those things where if you, if you understand, you understand that when you talk to the program manager, that can be a lot of times that's what they say, right? You want to find the hiring manager. That's the, that's the connection you got to make. Get on LinkedIn, find you a hiring manager. And, you know, make sure you connect with them. That that can be good, but it's it's a it's a it's a it's a sniper shot. It's one it's one it's one program. Whereas you know the, the recruiters, they're more covering a lot of ground. So there's they all have different roles to play. And again, if they push, you pull. If you pull, they push. You know. So as you talk to these people. Play, play the game that, they're, that they need you to play. It might mean giving a very general resume to the recruiter, and it also might mean saying, hey, Mark, what, what program is you? Let me, let me put together a specific resume for your program to answer your needs. Can I chime in? Yeah, Just, well, I, I want to keep this on track, but a, a real uh, trick of the trade as you're going through the job hunting process is use your connections from the past and really data mine through LinkedIn and see. So, if you're interested in the ABC company, reach out to your master chief, reach out to your bosses from former things, start the networking process and really dig down because sometimes it's finding that internal advocate. The recruiters are so overwhelmed. We are so buried in a plethora of emails that if you can find an internal advocate that can push on your behalf, that just helps to float your resume out more within the company is just drawing more attention. To have it. you ever found somebody like that for referral and, and, and they said to, the, like, to one of your recruiters, hey, this is the person you need to get in the interview? Yep, all the time. And I even, as, as you were speaking, I was even reflecting on previous positions that I've had with other companies. And typically I've had these um, opportunities because I knew someone that worked at that company and they were able to take my resume and get that. Directly to the hiring manager. And Andrew, what's it what's it like on your end when one of those fifteen hiring managers you got come by and says, "Hey, I ran into this person at a job fair, or I ran into this person at a conference," and they say, "How does that work?" I know it's just one company, but like, what's that like to get a referral from the? Oh, it happens all the time. I, I got one yesterday, actually, um, and it's great because half the process is already done. It's the process of of candidate, you know, uh, would it be a fit? Is the qualifications and. You know, Match up on the resume, and that the hiring manager already told me I, I want to talk to this person about this role. So I acted really fast on those. And as a matter of fact, the, you know, recruiters when they get those, things, that that becomes a template resume for like this is what this person's looking yeah. for. Because people like Andrew, you know, his job is basically based upon what kind of resumes he's bringing to the hiring manager. And if he's bringing a whole bunch of resumes, that he keeps bringing resumes that never get hired, then he loses his job. You know, and he needs to bring ones that they're on. So when the hiring manager says I want to talk to this person. Any yeah. anytime yeah. you reach out to anybody within a company, whether it's an old classmate or coach or an old business colleague, always attach your resume. Don't make the person go back and say, Can can I get your resume? Just attach it from the get-go and say, I'm looking for your guidance. Can you help me? You know, and it also helps. Nothing is more frustrating to recruiters. Than to get a blind email and a blind resume and say, here's my resume, put you back for me. I don't know you. I don't know what you want to do. I can look at your resume and steer you towards something, but that might not be your passion. It might not be what makes your heart sink. So work with us from the get go and give us an idea of what kind of opportunities you're. We're going to get to some questions from the audience a little bit towards the end. So if you've got questions, you can stay on to put that. One question I know a lot of people, how many people here have heard that the, you know, they look at your resume in six seconds and they decide what to do with it, right? You guys heard that, that type of thing? You know, a lot of people may not think that that's necessarily fair, um, but uh, one of the things I like to say is, is how many times do you look at a job posting and within six seconds you decide whether you want to apply or not? You're, you're pretty quick like that, ah, right? <laughs> so, but when it comes to those six seconds, so like, from, like how can that happen? Or where are we now? How can it happen that you can just look at something? Are you not that mean, are you? Well, I'm fighting the cold. No, I, I think it is true. I don't know about the six seconds, but within a matter of seconds, I can I can review a resume and and determine if I want to keep reading. First of all, if your resume is more than two pages, I don't have time. There are we have so many other resumes to review. But if I'm reading through your resume, I'm expecting to hear buzzwords. So I'm a Linux sysadmin. 
I better be hearing buzzwords about Linux, this admin stuff that's going to relate to me. If you're just being wordy and not listing anything that's technical, I'm not going to really, I'm, I can't gauge where you're going to fit, so you're probably not. In, in buzzwords, people are like, I never write buzzwords, that's not fair type of thing. Buzzwords are easier on technical things because you can yeah. look at certifications, you can look at languages, you can look at something. Buzzwords are not things like, you know, sort of the earth, you know, or. You you know, know. No, it's something that's, that's <laughs> relevant, you know. It's Red Hat, it's Ansible, it's scripting, it's programming, DNS, TCP, IP. Stuff, buzzwords that have to do with that realm. Yeah. So um, I'm going to go to Andrew and then we'll come back to you. So, so Andrew's a recruiter. You've obviously talked to these hiring managers. So, you know, and do you, for example, one question for you, do you typically recruit the same field generally <coughs> for you, like, or do you recruit across a whole bunch of Typically the same field, yeah. Yeah. Um, most of our roles are IT. Um, but I, I disagree. I don't always. I can look at a resume and see if the skills needed are there, but not oftentimes people don't know what's on a resume. Um, or sometimes their resumes are outdated. Um, so I can see, you know, if I'm looking for a SharePoint developer and someone has SharePoint listed, but they don't go into great details because they're trying to get a job as a program manager and they want to really talk about all the programs that they've worked on and support it. Um, oftentimes, like, you know, I can reach out and they'll tell me, oh, yeah, I have years of experience doing that. I didn't include it because I wasn't that I wanted to get into, but if you think I'd be good at it, then you know, I'm happy to do the world. So you have you, have you basically coached job seekers if yep. they if they you know to say like if you're gonna apply for this job, you need to you know you don't tell them why you don't tell them like and I've helped I've, I've helped them you know I'll say give me give me the information and I'll format the resume and send it back to you. Um, and this, so I think that's a difference between again a recruiter and a hire agent. Like he's got well he's not re reading resumes, he's doing systems administration stuff. Whereas the, the recruiter, that's the recruiter's job. And recruiter. I've, I've talked to some great recruiters in the past who they, they, they like have check marks of all the time that they've taken somebody's lousy resume, asked them the questions about what their experience was, found out what they didn't have on there, but they had the experience, helped them put together a resume and get a job because by the time it got to the program manager, he says, Oh, this is exactly what I was looking for. You know, thanks to the recruiter who helped. One of the phrases I use is you want to distill your resume, not to distill it down to the the core of what they're looking for, not throwing in your whole life story of the last 25 years or whatever the case is. Um, again, do you we, want to we, just add into all that conversation here? Yeah, and again, I'm unique. So we like two and three page resumes because we oh. want to go down and see concrete metrics of how big of a program have you managed, how many people have you managed. To get a better understanding, we have over 800 open jobs. So we need to really try to assess, are you a good fit for plutonium infrastructure? Are you more of an IT program manager? How are we going to place you? Uh, what I do, because I can't possibly learn the nuances of 800 job openings, is I'm trying to learn the different silos, and I'll shoot a resume over to a computer. And you know, I'm like, I think it's about 90% of what you're looking for, but you're the expert. You have to keep all eye on it. Yeah. And, not, and, and the recruiter that's sourcing for a specific job will give you concrete, hey, dude, if you want to apply for this job, add in more of this experience. In my case, I'm like, out of all of the resumes that I've seen to make you competitive, I think you need to add this and that. Just to draw out your experience more. And, and that's and this is why I love these conversations. I told the panel when I started, like, I, I don't mind if you disagree. Because I think sometimes, when you, especially for those of you who are coming out of the military, like veterans coming out, you, you hear, you go to tap class or whatever, but this is, here's the process. If you do X, Y, and Z, you will get a job, right? And it turns out that you, all of these things want different. So, what you want to do as a job seeker, you get to know people, is ask. Is ask you know, what, you know, you know, and that, this is where the recruiters you know, can be they're the easiest to find. This is the questions they ask the program managers when you read them at a job fair or whatever, is ask the questions of like, what do you need to see? What, if I, I, I'd like to put a resume together. What do you want to see? Do you want it short? Do you want it long? And whatever they ask for, that's what you do. Be prepared to go long or short, you know, or, you know, cover all your bases for the recruiter who might see other opportunities. So we as job seekers want to be flexible. You know, we want to have all of our all of our pieces of, of the puzzle that we can put together, but ask those questions. You know, that's, that could be a really valuable thing about the job. So again, my husband is my perpetual guinea pig. 
But when he retired from the Navy, he learned from working with his classmates, his peers, his senior officers. You know, he had one resume with with a uh, business marketing slant. He had another resume with a program management slant. My husband had eight different resumes angled in different ways to be agile. And before he applied for a job at the ABC company, he would reach out, you know, through the classmate network, the LinkedIn network, all the different social media networks. Hey, can you give me some guidance on what this company is looking for in the way of a resume? Every single company is going to have its own unique challenges. So, we, so now we're going to kind of shift over to the job fair. So what you guys are looking for a job fair. You know, what's, what, from your position, your personal role over there, like what, whether it's this, this job fair specific or just job fairs in general, like what's what's your kind of goal if you're in an event like this? We'll get into all three of you guys. You know, what is it that you're looking for? How are you looking to support you know, maybe yourself, your programs personally, or maybe to support your organization as a whole? Or do those things kind of mix and match? Like, what, what are you looking for to, to get out of these talking to jobs? Like that? So, <clears throat> my goal uh, today is to identify some candidates that are interested in moving. Either Denver <laughs> or Sunnyvale, California, <laughs> to be a network, <laughs> network, system, network engineer, Windows, Linux, sysadmin, um, and to get some people that really want to work yeah. and, and want to join Lockheed Martin and be part of what we're developing. That is my goal, plain and simple. <laughs> and it's, he's, but as a program manager, he's very focused on, on that. You know, that that's, that's a specific thing. Um, We'll get to the recruiters here in a second. But Michelle, we'll get to I, I brought three team senior leaders with me that are looking for jobs in their respective silos. My goal is to encourage you to keep your aperture open, be open to conversations and possibilities, and I'm here to plant the seed. If you take a leap of faith and we're open to relocating, there's a whole world of possibilities out there. My husband and I lived in Annapolis, Maryland for 25 years. Moved out to New Mexico uh, three and a half years ago and have never regretted it. For us, it's been a game changer. So just keep your aperture. Andrew, what you got? What, what you got going on as far as your career company wise? Um, I think it's just a matter of, of um, finding the right fit for the candidate. Um, we're able to bring someone on board with us. Um, our company and how great we are and what we do uh, now and in the future. Um, I think that's our, our main mission. Obviously, connections. Um, you know, we'll know other people who uh, refer to certain positions. Um, we actually have a refer, uh, referral program that we uh, utilize. So, um, you know, everyone needs a connection. So, I think that's the most important thing. And it's obviously great to be back in person. It is, yeah, it is great to be back in person. Yes. That, that we're so excited to be back in person. Um, and that's something that, you know, we, these are three different people, three different roles, but that when you wouldn't. When you get to their booth, you'll actually find a lot of the same types of people. Like, we just have a different slice, you know. Um, you know, like Michelle's talking about, she's got some program managers there. You know, Mark is a program manager there. He's got some recruiting folks there for Lucky Park too. So if, he, if it's, you're not a fit for his program, he can pass you off to, to those people who answer the bigger questions. You know, uh, Andrew's got lots. He's got a whole staff that's going to be there. Every morning, the same going to be there. Some other folks. So all these people here. But what can be valuable about coming to a job fair? Like this is what we did there is to ask those questions and make sure that you know. And the, the program managers who are here are the ones who are the, they have the greatest need. That's just all there is to it. I mean, if, if if he barely needed anybody, he would still be back in work. I got plenty to do. Other than be here with you guys. Yeah. So so, so when you, but when you're looking at job fairs, if you look at the companies that are going to be there, and you look at the positions that are listed in like our booklet has all the positions listed. That's not all the positions that company has, but that's the positions that, that, that they're specifically looking for here. So if you ever, whether, whether it's this job fair, future job fairs, when you look and see that like, that's what I do, you know, you, you need to come and you need to talk to those people more than just, just throwing your resume blindly out there because you can ask questions like, how should I submit it? And even if you're just in the ballpark, you never know, you might run into ad, like, something like that that says, well, we have a referral bonus, <laughs> you know, um, because a lot of times these companies here, they're also looking at the long term. They want to know, and, and so if, you, if you're not getting out for a year, no problem talking to people. They're, they're here for the next four hours, you know. But they can give you some of that, those tips about if you want to be competitive, you know, you want to fill in these gaps and, and be ready for, the, for those types of things. Um, can I just add to your 
to yeah, that point, if I, just for a quick second. Yeah, yeah. So just because I'm looking for people with TSSCI, I'm also representing other managers that are looking for people that just have secret clearances. So just because I need TSSCI, if you don't have it, it, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk. I can still take your resume and get it on the desk of the hiring manager that can help you. And hiring managers know each other. And I, you know, I guarantee you that when those hiring managers come back and they say, how was the job fair? It's a feedback like it was good, it was bad. It was, I saw a lot of these types of people. And if he hands a resume off to his, to his buddy, basically, and says, hey, I've brained this person, this might be good for your, for your program, you know, she might give you a call and say, hey, I heard you talk to Mark. I heard you met Mark. So it's, it's definitely worth it. Um, we got, we're doing pretty good on time. Before I go into the last couple of things, is there any questions that we, from what we covered so far? Anybody wants to ask any questions from our panel? Or should we just keep on moving with the next set of topics? What do you guys think? Anybody got some Don't questions? We know you have questions. So I do, I do have a question. Yeah. So, Y'all kind of hit on it. So I, I look at some of the qualifications. Remember, there's two qualifications. Eight of those ten. So what, what's the threshold that you would say would make an effective person? Should I, should I apply for the eight out of ten? Or what's, what's kind of your, your threshold? So we'll, we'll, go, we'll go down the line with Marco first, and, and we'll say that we'll also talk about how job descriptions might be created and set that, that up, too, as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, my view in life is <clears throat> I'm going to make, if I'm applying to your job, you tell me I'm not qualified, right? I'm not going to say, oh, I only, only have eight of ten requirements, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to apply. I'm not going to do that. I, you tell me that I'm not a fit for your job. So, and a lot of these qualifications, honestly, a lot of them are set by HR, right? There's a lot of things that go into at Lockheed Martin to Iraq that are kind of predetermined by Lockheed. Uh, but if you feel that you have, that you meet, even if it's two of them, you apply. Let someone else tell you that you're not a fit. That's my two cents. Michelle, and then Andrew, we're on three meetings. <laughs> and the way of our job is for our jobs are posted, we have minimum skills and we have desired qualifications. You have to, because we, because we're DOE, you have to meet every single way. If you can read a job opening and look at the minimum skills and say, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that, then you know if you can speak to any of the desired qualifications, that's an extra bonus point. And I won't take your time now, but we have very stringent cover letter requirements. And again, I'm here to advocate for you and educate you on that process. Now, with Andrew, you've got lots of you cover lots of different recs, you know, obviously. So I would say still go ahead and apply. Um, <coughs> but our, our requisitions are somewhat the same. We have minimum, we have desired, heard, and all of that. Um, I mean, personally, you don't have it. Um, Certification or you know certain skills that they're looking for. I always ask the question. It's hard to yeah, because um, that's important. Um, for me and you know nine times out of ten. Well, yeah, that's the other person. You know, has eight out of ten skills. Good. Right? Let's let's interview him. Oh, you would hire him. Okay, but if I was sitting here looking for ten out of ten, yeah, you know, may, may have passed. So one of the things about doing the job seeker too is you have to remember you have to think to yourself like, am I am I and I don't want to be mean to anybody, but but do I have very unique skills that very few people possess, or do I have skills that lots of people possess? There's nothing wrong with being either one of those people. But if you talk to a recruiter, sometimes their 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 hardest job is finding the people. Sometimes their hardest job is sorting through all of these applications that they got. So if you're one of many applications for a position that doesn't have too many requirements, it's very easy to, to skip over things. If you are if you are somebody you know that, that does super specific stuff. They might say, well, we can get you this last thing because I'm not, I don't know where I'm going to find the next one of those, right? So you have to really do understand whether well, this is the kind of thing. In cybersecurity, for example, if you're a senior-level cybersecurity person, you're, you're super sought after. If you're an entry-level help desk person, there's every, people are graduating from that program left and right. You know, so, so the other thing is those requirements, the, a couple things might be non-negotiable. Things like clearance, like you said. If that's the one thing you're missing is a full-scope poly clearance, you know, that could be the game breaker right there. But if it's, if it's one of the other things, like a certification, you know, maybe not. So they, they all gave great answers. They all had different answers, too. Um, so it's, it's part of that is, is relationship type stuff. 
Uh, let's, any other questions before we get to the next thing? Okay. So let's jump into the interview then. All right, so we came to a job fair, you got all these resumes and talked to these people, and you were like, dude, you are awesome. We want to bring you in for an interview. Let's start with, let's, let's start with Andrew. Like, how would that process happen? Would you, would you just tell him to show up? Do you coach him? Do you, are all interviews the same from all your hiring managers? What's, what's your take on interviews there? So typically, uh, our, our interviews are conducted via Zoom for Microsoft Teams, not really in person, um, but they're all different. Um, I, I do have a, you know, uh, call with the candidate prior and let them know what the hiring manager um, is going to be in the interview, um, what kind of questions they'll be asking, maybe some government customer may be involved, um, just, you know, so they, they go in and know what they're to expect, and obviously what to say. Mm -hmm. so, Michelle, what, what, what kind of stuff are you we doing? Do, we do panel interviews at Los Alamos. Uh, it used to be the pre-COVID, they would fly the candidate out there to check out the site and take a look at it. I've heard that we're slowly getting back to that, but they're mostly panel interviews now. And our interviews at the panelists house, they're going to be diving down into your knowledge of the job that's being posted. So the guidance I gave to the candidates is be prepared, to speak to every single bullet point and every nuance of the job posting because they're going to do a deep dive into that to make to make sure that you weren't fluffing on your resume. So so before we jump into Mark, remember resumes don't get you jobs, <coughs> resumes get you interviews. Right? And then once you get to the interview, they're gonna ask you some of those, those deeper questions. And they're, they're also gonna start to talk to you about some that's when you can start talking about some soft skills. Maybe Mark will talk about teamwork and how it might depend on your team. But you know, it, answering all those questions. So well, by the time they get to you now, this is a big thing for you because you cleared your schedule, right? Is it, right. What, and I know you're just one program, Monty, but do, do you, is it just you that does the interview? Do you have a team of people? So um, we will conduct the phone interview with you. Uh, I will be on the interview uh, as well as uh, probably two other people on our team. Uh, and, and to be fair to all candidates, we ask the same questions of every candidate for every rec. Um, and to her point, right, be prepared to talk about whatever rec it is that you've applied. Um, even tailor your resume towards that rec because I'm going to, I know the rec and I'll probably have it up. I'll have your resume and I'm going to ask you very specific questions pertaining to the rec. So I need to make sure you have the technical knowledge to be able to fulfill the job. We'll also ask you some uh, team questions. You know, how your interpersonal skills, how do you deal with conflict, uh, various other things that you may encounter with uh, different types of end users. So, yeah, the, the interview piece is, is, is huge. And then after that, um, how do you feel? I always tell people, I want to get your, your take on, especially you, Mark, if you're doing interview. Um, I tell people, when you do your interview, make sure you have some questions for them, right? So. You know, like what you well, what what do they say? What you say? You have any questions? They go, nope, no questions. Yeah. Pretty so, much. right. <laughs> not only am I interviewing you, but you should be interviewing us, not just me, but every person that's that's um, possibly interviewing you. You know, you're gonna want to find out. Hey, Mark, what is your role? If if I were to be accepted for this position, what is your role, and how would I interact with you and with each other uh, the, the people in the interview? So you definitely want to be asking me questions. And it's not the, hey, what's your time off policy? How much vacation do I get? Ask real questions. Hey, how, how would you handle this situation? If, if, if I have too much to do and I'm getting yelled at, are you going to be there for me? And if so, how? How are you going to support me? So it's a two-way street. Yeah, and that's, that's a piece that I think a lot, of, a lot of job seekers, because they're so nervous, you know, they want to they want to treat like a sailor in a court or something like that, and they're you know, kind of staying in attention, ready to stay answer questions, or I have no questions, I think. Ask those questions. So another question that I have, and I'll put this to all of you guys too, is um, at the end, you can ask, I always tell people, tell me if I'm wrong, you can ask a question like, what do, what's the next step supposed to be? What can I expect to hear something back? Because there's nothing worse than walking out and you go back home and, you're, and your loved one and says, how was the interview? It was great. What are you going to do? I don't know. Right? Now I'm going to walk on eggshells for how long. So if someone were to say, you know, what's the next step? So first of all, do you think any of your hiring managers will take offense to that? And we'll get to Mark because it's an actual would, would they take offense to that, or would that be something else you would take care of? Or? Oh, no, they, they would probably tell you that what Andrew would be in touch with you. However, 
I'll be in touch with you once they tell me what <laughs> what, what to do, uh, where we're going. So uh, it definitely helps to have that conversation because it kind of lets them know that, hey, I'm, I'm urgent. I'm, I'm actively applying, and I want to know right, right now uh, what the next step of the process is going to be. Um, I can tell them all day that the market's hot and that, you know, you're on the market today, you may be gone tomorrow, but you going ahead and, and putting that urgency helps. Yeah. Mark or Andrew can't give you the, uh, the job offer or the word until he gets the word. You know, um, so something else that, that, that goes along with that too is, is um, uh, if, if you go to an interview and you really want the job, make sure when you go on, you send you that, the, the, the message back, like an email or something, let them know you really want the job. It's like Mark said, you're actually interviewing them. So if you walk out and say, after learning so much about, you know, Los Alamos and the, you know, the nuclear reactors, which I had no idea about, you know, nuclear propulsion, whatever you're doing, Los Alamos, I can't wait. I want that job, or whatever the case may be, or why you love Denver, you know, um, for, for all his, or Sunnydale, California, or something else. Sunnydale, And it's okay to ask about the company culture, too. Yeah. Uh, my husband was kind of shocked the first day he wore blue jeans to work. In his whole career, over 30 years, he never was like walking around like, this is, <laughs> like our culture is so laid back at the at Los Alamos, that of course, like he might have a different culture. They might have a, a dress down Fridays only, or, or whatever. But ask about what's what are the team dynamics like? What are my opportunity for career growth? Uh, can I continue my education with your company? So we are running out of time. So what we do is we're going to do this way. Do you guys want to say before we let everybody go? And then once we let them go, like I said. Um, they've got to get back to their tables, so when they leave, let them leave. I'll hang around to, to ask, uh, answer any questions or just chat about stuff. I'm not going anywhere. I work for third down like that, so I'm going to be here. They've got more than to their tables, so let them leave when they do. Um, make sure that you swing by their table. I'm sure they can give you their contact information if they want to. Um, Party words. Uh, Andrew, appreciate everyone coming out today. Look forward to uh, speaking to people and uh, hopefully find a position. And I'm grateful and excited to have you here. And again, I'll just say once again, keep your aperture open to this real conversation today. And I'll, I, 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 I really <laughs> nice to uh, look forward to meeting you guys and, and, and she hit it on the head. There's a whole world out there. If you're just willing to, to step a little further and take a chance. So, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great panel. I really, really enjoyed it. I'm so glad to be back with you in person again. Um, so, thank uh, you for inviting you. us. This yeah, is great. Thank you. Thank you.